Hello, good evening, and welcome back to our Bible study. And I look forward to seeing you on the Lord's Day at 10:30 and at four o'clock this week, when we'll celebrate the Lord's table. And so we're in Psalm 119, and we pick up the section called Lambda between 89 and 96. So that's the section between 89 and 96 of Psalm 119. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me. For I, ha for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. This is God's word. We've seen the theme of affliction running through the last several stanzas of the psalm. Tonight, we see an answer to affliction, and it's found in the word of God itself. I want to look at five things in particular that the psalmist tells us that helped him in the midst of his affliction and persecution so we can be helped in the midst of our own trials, tribulations, persecutions and afflictions. So the first thing I'd like you to take away tonight is that the firm foundation of God's word is what we're all about at Lake Road Chapel, the firm foundation of God's word. And we see it in Psalm 89, sorry, verse 89 of Psalm 119, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. The psalmist is saying that God's word is our firm foundation. God's word shores us up in every trial and calamity. It is the thing that buttresses us. It is the thing that makes us, helps us, enables us to stand. It is our firm foundation. The first stanza is about the word. The rest of the song is about the trials. And we stand firm in the trials of the rest of the song because of the firm foundation of the word. David Dixon in his commentary says, God has given us his word to bear up our faith in even the hardest conditions. And it is a sure rock which will not fail us. Whatsoever appear and howsoever we fail or faint, the word of God is that which holds us up. The first thing that the psalmist teaches us is that God's word is our firm foundation. It's true. We love it. We preach it. But God's word is our firm foundation. It is God's word that shores us up, that it helps us, that guides us through every trial, every calamity, every affliction. Secondly, God's word is above contradiction. Again, staying in verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. What a wonderful combination. The word is firmly fixed. And when you think of that foundational things, you think of concrete, you think of footings, you think of um, foundations, something in the earth. But it's a mixed metaphor. It's firmly fixed, not down here, but up there in the heavens. What is going on with the picture? Well, we're told a second thing here. Not only is the word our firm foundation, but God's word is higher, is above contradiction. It is a firm foundation above contradiction. God's word is above the challenge, the contradiction, or the sullying of this earth. Sometimes God tells us things that are true that we can't see with our own eyes. Sometimes God promises us things that we do not see fulfilled. So the truth of his word is clouded from our eyes. David Dixon again in his commentary says, albeit the effect of God's word appears not sometimes, but is overclouded with trouble and temptation. Yet it is sure and fixed by God's decree, unalterable in heaven, and it cannot lack its effect in due time. It always is true. It never fails. It is unalterable in the heavens above. Well, that made me think, this passage makes me think of J.R. Tolkien's book, The Lord of the Rings. And there's a point in the story where two the two companions in Lord of the Rings, Sam and Frodo, 
have gone into a very evil country and the hero Frodo has been, Sam thinks, mortally wounded. And Sam is left alone in a dark country surrounded by his enemies and he thinks that the quest is lost. J.R. Tolkien says this and I quote, they're keeping among the cloud rack above a dark tor, high up in the heavens, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart. As he looked up out of that forsaken land, hope returned to him. For like a shaft clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing and there was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. You see what the beauty of what Tolkien is saying? He's in the midst of a story that looks dark and bleak and hopeless. Evil seems to be overrunning the earth. Evil seems to be winning. But when he saw the star, he saw something that evil couldn't reach and couldn't touch and could not sully and could not extinguish. And the psalmist is telling you God's word is firmly fixed in the heavens. No trouble here can ultimately contradict his word. No trial here can ultimately challenge it. No sin here can sully it. It is fixed in the heavens. And when evil is finally vanished, vanquished from the world, the word will still be here, forever firmly fixed in the heavens. That is a thought that we must regularly take in, believe in this world, especially as we as believers face a world, a country, a nation that is a stranger to truth. And this world, this culture looks upon Christians as strange interlopers and dangerous aliens and subversive bigots because of the things that we believe and you may be tempted to think that evil has won but it hasn't and it is not will never be because God's word is firmly fixed where in the heavens this evil will pass but heaven and earth will pass but his word will never pass away that's the second thing I'd love you to take away tonight God's word is our foundation God's work word is above contradiction third thing I'd love you to take away is God's word is as certain as his faithfulness. We see this in verse 90. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. And the psalmist is drawing our attention to God's faithfulness. And he does this in order to press home this truth that God's word is as certain as his faithfulness. God's word is as certain as his faithfulness. God's name expresses his character. God's name teaches us about who he essentially is. So when the angels in Isaiah's vision are looking upon God while veiling their faces, what do they say? Holy, holy, holy. In Revelation, when the Lamb is seen, at one point he is called faithful and true. That is his name, faithful and true. And the psalmist is saying, your God is faithful and true, and therefore you can trust his word. Have you ever had a friend who in God's kindness, that God has put you in his life, so the friend, when he tells you something, he really means it. You can count on it. So when the friend says, I will pray for you, you know he will. His word is true because he is faithful. Or when the friend says, we're going to go through this thing together. We're going to get through it together. So everyone else may lose interest after a while. But you know your friend will stick with you through thick and thin. His word can be trusted because he is faithful. The psalmist is saying God's word is as certain as his faithfulness. And then look how he argues the point in verse 90 leading into 91. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. He's pointing to God's fidelity to his covenant promises from one generation to another. And the psalmist illustrates that by the way that God's providence oversees nature. Verse 90. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. Verse 91. By your appointment they stand this day for all things are your servants. The psalmist is saying that the very stability of the world depends on God's faithfulness, which is a theme that goes all the way back to the story of Noah. Remember our story of Noah, Genesis 8, Genesis 6 through 8. And after the flood has disrupted the world and the seasons of planting and harvest have been undermined by the flooding of the earth, God promises Noah and the successive generations that from that time forth until the end of the world, Seed time and harvest, summer and winter, sun and moon, season after season, will not be disturbed. By God's word, he promises. And from Noah's day until today, God has established the seasons. He has planted the earth. 
He has continu continued the revolution of the earth and the sun and the planets in accordance with his word. And the psalmist is saying that God, who in his providence oversees the world and makes it stable and makes the seasons come and go, is the God who has made promises to you in his word. So therefore, you can believe these promises because the one who has spoken them is the faithful and true. That's the third thing I'd love you to take away tonight. That God's word is our firm foundation. God's word is high above contradiction. And God's word is as certain as his own faithfulness. Fourthly, I'd love you to take away that God's word is our sure hope in affliction. We see that in, this especially in verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. God's word is our sure hope in affliction. William Plumer, William S. Plumer, in his wonderful commentary, says, Such is the weight of many of our earthly sorrows, that nothing but scripture received in faith and applied by the Holy Ghost can sustain the sinking heart. There are sorrows that many of us face that nothing can help except <laughs> the word of God. You've got someone, someone that's close to death, or a family that's grieving the loss of a child. Or when, when somebody's on the verge of death, what do you have? You have the word of God. That's what they need and it is sufficient. Let me just give you some examples. I'll put them in the notes as well. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. That's the word of God. Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. John 14, verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. John 16, verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. A few verses from Romans 8, 28, for we know that all, for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. 38 and 39, for I am sure neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's word is our sure hope in affliction. Those verses, those verses are our sure hope in affliction. Charles Bridges says, each promise of God's word is a staff. If we have but faith to lean upon it, it is able to bear our whole weight in sin, care and trial. Back to David Dixon. Affliction draws forth the worth of God's word, which otherwise we might not have known. And it lets it be seen that the word of God is able to save a sinking man in tribulation. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. One little word will fell him. Who? The devil. One little word. God's word. And that word is above all earthly powers. And that word is our sure hope in affliction. God's word is our firm foundation. God's word is above contradiction. God's, we trust God's word because of his faithfulness. God's word is our sure hope in affliction. And fifthly and lastly, God's word is above contradiction. Verse 96, I've seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly, exceedingly, exceedingly broad. I beg your pardon. Not only is God's word our firm foundation, not only is God's word above contradiction, not only is God's word as certain as his faithfulness, not only is God's word our sure hope and affliction, God's word is beyond perfection. Now think of these things, my friends. Have you ever found... Have you ever, ever found the limits of the sufficiency of God's word? Have you ever been in a place where God's word was outsmarted by your circumstance? Have you ever ascended to the heights of its excellency and said, I know all the excellency of the word of God. There's nothing left for me to understand. I'll stop coming to church to hear the word because there's nothing left for me to understand. Have you ever even been close? Have you ever even gotten there? I'll be very disappointed if you say you have. I've been studying this word for 40 years and I haven't seen a little, I've only scratched the surface of its excellency. Can you fathom the depths of all its mysteries? Do you not come to verses that just shut your mouth? 
and you have to pray because you can't even begin to comprehend the mystery, the glory that has been revealed in just words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We say this, but that's we don't we don't we can only scratch the surface. The world could be filled with books just explaining those words in the prologue of the Gospel of John. Have you plumbed the depths of its mystery? Have you conceived the extent of its promises? Have you ever come to the point where you say, Yea, Lord, I know your promises experimentally. I understand them. I believe them, all of them. Have you ever conceived the extent of his promises? Can you hear Jesus praying in John 17? Father, I would that they would share the love with which you have loved me from the beginning of the world. Do you understand that blessing? Do you conceive that promise? Have you ever been able to take the dimensions of the love of God to sinners? Can you say, as Paul prayed, that you know the height and the depth and the breadth of the love of God? Do you know the depth of the iniquity that the word of God unfolds? So often I go to the word of God that it teaches me things about my own sin that I didn't know. Is there any other book like that in the world? That's one of the reasons I believe in the inerrancy, the inspiration, the infallibility, the profitability, the profitability of the word of God. Because it knows me better than I know me in my sin. I go there and I'm introduced to my own sin. How can that be? How can this book introduce me to my own sins? Because the word of God is exceedingly, exceedingly broad. It is beyond perfection. It is the mind of God. It is the revelation of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. Have you ever understood the fullness of the preciousness of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Which the word of God holds out as your atonement, your propitiation. Can you say, I know how precious the blood of Jesus is. I know its full extent. My friends will never be able to say any of these things until glory. We'll know its preciousness more and more and we'll never see an end to its perfection. Brothers and sisters, dear friends, the word of God is exceedingly broad. And we may have seen a limit to human perfection, but we'll never see a limit to its perfection because God's word is beyond perfection. The psalmist's words are to us in times of trial, affliction, lockdown. Just remember God's word is our foundation. Please remember God's word is above contradiction. Please remember God's word is as certain as his own faithfulness. Remember that it is our sure hope in affliction. And remember it is definitely, certainly beyond perfection. May God bless the word. May you be encouraged for his glory.